Hey everybody, I hope you're having a good day. I am now finishing up my two-part review of the Revel F35 floor standing loudspeaker. Now, in my previous review, I talked about my subjective listening impressions, and I did it basically in real time. Some of you had comments and concerns about me not breaking in the speaker, so let me address that real fast. The reason I did not break in the speaker uh, is multifold. For one, I follow manufacturer's recommendations for break-in. If it says 50 hours, I'll do that. If it says 100, fine, I'll do that. Even if I think it's ridiculous, I'll do it anyway just to cover my bases. The manufacturer did not have a recommendation for break-in for the speaker, which is what I expect from this particular brand. The main reason, being honest, is because the video that I made before was kind of done as a kick in the pants to people who say that I don't listen to speakers before I measure them and that it's just a bunch of bull crap and I only talk about what I heard based off of me seeing the measurements, which just isn't true, but I thought it would be fun to let you in to see part of my review process. And in that, I unboxed the speaker, I set them up in real time, and I gave you my feedback, just like boom, 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 boom. So I didn't properly break in the speakers or go through the full break in period, uh, like I might for another brand or something like that. And then I went and measured the speaker and then did everything else after that. but. Like I said, I was trying to make the timeline very clear so nobody could say, oh, you measure the speaker in between while I was actually breaking in or something. Having said that, I measured the speaker, I brought it back in, and then I listened to it for a few more days. And basically, my subjective take did not change. So to recover that, what I said in that was that the bass sounded a little bit off. Something's a little bit off in the bass for me. And it was hard for me to put my finger on it. Ultimately, I thought that the 50, 60 hertz fundamental for a kick drum sounded pretty much right. But I think that the 100 to 120 Hertz region sounded a little bit off. Like it just didn't have that punch to it uh, that I expected. I also noted that there was a little bit extra warmth in Nora Jones's vocal. And I said, I think I said maybe 300 to 500 Hertz. I don't even know if I ballparked it in frequency. I also noted that the upper mid range was missing a bit of attack, uh, some clarity and detail. And then I said that the treble region between about four and six kilohertz sounded a little bit edgy, a little bit sibilant, okay? So how did I do? And why did I say the things that I said and was it even remotely close? Well, we're gonna talk about that in this video. And frankly, I think this is the most interesting aspect to doing reviews. And it kind of goes to show you why you can't trust a solely subjective review, no matter how good you think somebody's ears are. I'll put it this way. If I'm considering buying a speaker, I'm listening to myself before I take anybody's advice. I don't care who it is. All right. Makes me kind of a hypocrite for even doing subjective stuff, but you know what? That's part of the game. And I don't know, I guess I enjoy it. So with that said, let's talk about the speaker a little bit. This is a two and a half way four driver design. It is ported on the rear, features a one inch aluminum dome tweeter in a waveguide. It has a five and a quarter inch mid range and two five and a quarter inch mid bass drivers. The sensitivity is spec'd at 90 decibels, impedance spec'd at six ohm. These speakers are currently on sale for about $450 each, down from $880 each. So they're almost half off. And I'll go ahead and tell you up front. I think at this price, it's a no brainer. The closest thing that I can compare it to, at least right now, in terms of floor standing speakers for the budget price, would be the ELAC DF63 that I reviewed recently. But I believe those are around $699 each. So you're looking at about $1,400 for a pair, whereas these on sale are $900 a pair. Now let's talk about the sound clip. This is a comparison between baseline pink noise with this speaker's response overlaid on it. On axis, both high passed above 80 hertz. Listen for the difference between the original and the speaker version. This is not to tell you how great these speakers sound in your system over your speakers. It's strictly for an AB comparison. So you get an idea of what this speaker is doing to the signal source. Okay, cool. Frequency response of this speaker is 89.4 decibels measured, and F3 is at 61 hertz, F10 is at 39 hertz. You're gonna need a subwoofer if you wanna get down low with this speaker. 
mid range shows a little bit of a dip in the lower region. And then as we go higher in frequency, we see this dip around two to three K. And then we see this peaking around five kilohertz or so. Now these two match pretty closely to what I heard. The other two things that I said, a bit of warmth to Nora Jones vocal, and then some missing punch in the kick bass area, maybe not so much. Now, the only way that I can maybe say that the kick bass aspect was correct is by me pointing to the 100 to 120 hertz region. So this region right here, okay? Notice it's a little bit lower and like a little bit lower, a decibel and a half at most compared to the 80 to 90 hertz region. For my own personal taste, I've been tuning and designing car audio systems and playing around with home audio DIY for about 20 years now. It seems like the majority of the time I add in a little bit more between one to 120, like a decibel, maybe two, uh, to give me a little bit more sound of a kick. So that's where my preference lies. And that may be detached from what you like, but hopefully that makes sense. Now, the other aspect of the added warmth, you know, honestly, I'm just not seeing it. I was saying maybe like three to 500 Hertz and this kind of looks all right. Now I can excuse myself if I say compared to male vocal on the lower region where you see a little bit of a dip right in this region, that's about a one and a half decibel. So you're looking at maybe a decibel difference between the male vocal and the female vocal in the fundamental area. But frankly, I don't think it's enough for me to say, yeah, that's actually what I heard in the room. Most likely it's the room itself. And you guys know that if you take a speaker and you put it near a wall or move it out from a wall, or you put a speaker and you move it from room to room, it's going to sound different. And I know some of you are thinking, aha, I've got you. This is why data doesn't matter. And it only matters what you hear in your room. Well, first of all, it 1000% matters what you hear in your room. I've never contested that. The usefulness of the data is, let's say you got the same room. You probably don't have different rooms. Let's say that you got the same position that you can put the speaker in the room. That's probably true. Now let's say you've got data for these different speakers and you want to compare them without having to buy all five of them at one time. You can do that and you can find which speaker fits your needs and then you can listen to them in the home. It does not account for the aesthetic, whether you like the look of it or not. It doesn't account for whether it has appeal to maybe your friends or if you're trying to impress friends doesn't account for the budget that you have doesn't account for the fact that you can bring it in as Catherine one of my patreon members shout out Catherine often says is it uh, back friendly right so I can't bring in a big old heavy loudspeaker into my room if I've got back issues but a lighter one will do the job and does that lighter one kind of capture what maybe the heavy one does where data is. That's where data is useful. I know many of you tuned out. I already hit the cancel button, but if you're still here, I appreciate it. All right, let's keep going. The CEA 2034 data set shows good overall response. The reactivity mismatch that you see right here is due to the separation between the tweeter and the mid range. So I would say that you could pretty effectively equalize the speaker within reason. Okay. This is the estimated in room response. And this shows kind of how I heard the speaker. Things we've already talked about, in-room extension to about 60 hertz, get a subwoofer scooped attack and detail region, mild, but noticeable to me. Peaking lower treble has a bit of sibilance, a little bit of edge. I've already addressed the 100 to 120 aspect and the added warmth aspect. Burst decay looks pretty good. These are really low in level, 27 decibels down. Okay, not a worry. Horizontal contour plot gives us an idea of what the radiation of the speaker is horizontally. Now, the thing that really matters here is you see this peaking right around three kilohertz. You might want to absorb that. But on the flip side, at the speaker's price of $900 a pair now, I don't know that the same people who are spending that kind of money on a speaker are also going to want to go out and buy $100 in, or maybe 120, 130, 40, 50 even, uh, in absorption panels to take care of this issue. And honestly, it's rather benign for the most part. But if you wanted to go the extra mile, I would recommend you do that. You cannot equalize that. Why can you not equalize that? All of these colored areas represent a relative level difference to the direct sound. And the direct sound is when the speaker is pointed directly at you. If you go off axis out to about 60 to 70 degrees, the level of the tweeter is higher than the direct sound. If it were matched with the direct sound, it would not have a peak right through this area. So that means that the sound that goes off to the side of the speaker at about 70, 60 degrees hits a wall, comes back to you higher in amplitude 
than the direct sound. You cannot equalize that because if you're trying to EQ the direct sound up to account for a dip on axis, then you're also equalizing this stronger reflection up as well. So you're just fighting against each other. And that's why you would be best served to fix this with acoustic absorption. But honestly, I don't know that you have to do that. I probably wouldn't even bother unless you really just wanna go the extra mile. This is the vertical contour plot. Stay at the tweeter level. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels, 96 decibels. Both of these look pretty good to me. Multitone distortion also looks good. And if you add a high pass filter to this speaker, multi-tone distortion pretty much stays the same. Long-term compression shows about a decibel loss at around 100 hertz. Short-term compression shows some increased distortion in the tweeter area, and then some increased compression in the higher frequency area. And then this area is kind of par for the course. Now this speaker being how much it costs, honestly, I think this looks pretty good. Impedance, around 3.8 ohm at minimum. You do see a couple resonances here. Now, if I wanted to be extra tricky, then I could say, oh, remember that warmth that I was talking about? Well, that's this resonance at 300 Hertz. This, yeah, that's it, yeah. But honestly, it's probably just the room. Probably should have done some paneling, moved the speaker around, or just EQ that area down. And that does it for this review. I hope you appreciate the transparency. You know, like I could say that I heard all these things and make up stuff for why the measurements may not quite show it. Or as I said, you know, say, oh, this resonance here, that's what I heard. But I'm just trying to keep it real. And I like doing both the subjective and the objective because it gives me things to pay attention to and to relay to you, yeah, this is a real issue or, hey, maybe this thing that I heard, it's not a real issue. It's gonna be more room dependent. I think that level of transparency is very important in a review and without it, you know, you're just, it's just a best guess. And that's also why I don't rely on subjective reviews, for real. If if I'm interested in a speaker, I don't care what anybody has said about it. I want to listen to it and then I'll measure it. And then I'll do the whole thing just like I'm doing here. Nothing would change about my process if I'm buying the speaker. But my idea here with this channel is to relay to you the things that I go through about listening to a speaker and the things that I find interesting. And I hope that you find it interesting too. So with that in mind, if you don't mind, leave me a thumbs up. And if you'd have a second, maybe leave me a little comment below. That helps the algorithm. If you'd like to support this channel, you can do so a number of, a couple different ways, actually. Uh, you can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. You can use any of my generic affiliate links below. And with that said, shill alert, shill alert, shill alert. I'm going to drop an affiliate link in the description section below if you decide to buy these. If you decide to buy these, not making you do it. Uh, please consider using that affiliate link. It earns me a small commission, doesn't cost you anything. And if you don't want to use an affiliate link, you're just going to Google it and be happy and buy them anyway. I will talk to you all later. Hope you have a good night. Take care.